you bring up two really important uh, issues here. One is about uh, post Gaddafi Libya. And let's start here. You write in a recent New York Times op-ed that it's already over for Gaddafi. Even before the intervention began, you had predicted um, that this would be a rebel victory in all scenarios. And so I'd like to um, begin by asking you, why do you feel that victory is inevitable for uh, the rebellion forces or the revolutionary forces? I think the regime, when it shot at its own people, lost all legitimacy in the eyes of the majority of uh, Libyans, even the one who were alienated, what they really thought that reform will, uh, will be peaceful, they could accomplish in a peaceful way the objectives of having an account gov accountable government, uh, fighting corruption, having a constitution, having a free press, uh, uh, having um, work, and, and, and also um, institutions like uh, education and health will be rebuilt again. All the, the things that are really dear to the vast majority of the Libyan people. When that door was closed by shooting at the protesters and, and uh, unleashing the armies and, and the brigades on, on the people, people began to say, this regime is not reformable. That's the one thing, turning point that we, we have to keep in mind. Second, I think the regime lost its legitimacy and moral um, 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 acceptance among vast majority of Libyans, not just the elite, not just the opposition, not just the intellectuals. I'm talking about ordinary Libyans. Uh, in that sense, the regime lost. I also was careful to say that it would be misleading to uh, think of Gaddafi and his small now you know, uh, circle and their brigades as something a joke or something of um, uh, you know a, a clown that who is going to uh, be uh, removed easily. I think the regime lost in a de facto legitimate moral way. It, it, it's there. It's still there, and I don't think we should kid ourselves that's going to disappear overnight. At the same time, uh, the the fight um, for a moral, a plural, democratic Libya began now. The regime imposed um, this, um, you know, um, a violent um, scenario on the uh, revolution. And w there are two, um, two uh, ways of thinking about that. You know, Libya could, even though it's homogenous, it, it's educated, um, the people are educated and urban now, most of them live in urban cities, 80% of them li live in urban cities. It could also if people are not careful, especially the opposition and the leadership in Benghazi, they, it could also, uh, this, this, um, this conflict could prolong for a long time, and God forbid, Libya could um, you know, uh, go into um, the uh, example of, of um, failed states like Iraq and Somalia. I think it, 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 it shouldn't go that way. I'm very optimistic, but that needs a little bit of work on the, on the, on the part of the uh, democratic uh, Libyan consul in Benghazi in trying to keep institutions uh, in trying to arm and discipline those young men and women who are uh, marching without sometimes discipline and also in having um, uh, medicine and, and food um, and also raise their message and voice so the whole world will, will listen to them and also uh, I hope that the United States and the United Nations will impose uh, very very strict uh, pressure on the uh, the African countries, the Arab countries that are supporting him, not to send him any arms, any supporters, so the Libyan could settle that in their own way, hopefully quickly. And and then that the biggest challenge would be how to build alternative democratic um, pluralistic society in Libya. And I'm afraid, as in Tunisia, and I might add, even in in Egypt. That's the real battle, the second battle. What we have now in Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, and the rest of the Arab world is democratic revolution, but also we have counter-revolution as well. Uh, what happened in, in Bahrain was shameful that um, the United States government, the Obama administration, will allow the reactionary Saudi government and its allies to crush an uprising there and use the Iranian um, you know, a scary, um, uh, you know, um, boogeyman, uh, the Iranian boogeyman, right. 
That's right. And, and, and say, you know, this is really, Iran has taken over Bahrain, that stretched it to, Arabia, to Saudi Arabia. Let's just, um, uh, you know, um, understand what's going on there. That's, I think, um, um, really a shameful um, um, situation where a vast majority of Bahrainis who are calling for legitimate demands are being crushed and, and in front of our own eyes. Uh, I find that appalling. And, and we have to understand that this is really an important battle, and not only inside these countries where people are demanding specific democratic rights, but also be aware that the, uh, the so-called allies, the dictatorships, and also the absolutist monarchs are trying to cling to power. And unless we understand that, and unless we fight all those orientalist uh, categories and filters of tribalism, of extremism, or people be, are going to create anarchy, or the fundamentalists are going to take over, uh, unless we really confront these lenses and these filters, I think uh, the, the battle is not over. People are heroically are revolting for democratic rights, thank God, finally. But also, the, the second part of the revolution haven't even started. That's building a stable, democratic, accountable institutions, and also creating a new culture where people become a part of, of this new democratic um, uh, um, republics, we hope. Professor or Ahmed, can I 